Hi, here's a basic demo on how to get um, HTTP, <laughs> HTTP traffic working under Java. So how to get your web stuff going backwards and forwards. I've written a file, I've opened up a terminal to the unit, to a remote machine, and what directory am I in? I'm in a directory uh, in the CS2911 account, in the public HTML directory, that's where the web browser's root, is, uh, the web server um, that's the root place it starts looking for web files. I'm in a subdirectory of that called 10s1 and here are the files in the directory uh, and I've just uh, created one now called demo.html. You can see it over here. Let's have a look at demo.html. Very simple file. It's an HTML file. You can see that. It's just text, isn't it? It's a text file but the text is HTML text. Um, it's got a tag saying the beginning of the HTML file, a tag saying it's the end of the HTML file, then the rest of it's divided into a head. I mean, the contents are divided into a head, which gives us a title, which will be a simple web page, and the body, which gives us what will be displayed in the main browser window. And it basically um, is just a title called Design Patterns, and then the text, uh, E-U-R-R-R, Ting Tang, Walla Walla, Bing Bang. Then that ends the whole thing. So it's a very, very, very simple web page. Okay, so that's at the UniDAP page. Now, on this local machine, I can see that page through the miracles of web browsing that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Let's see how that works. First of all, we type the address, HTTP, the protocol we want to use, the name of the machine we want to connect to, www.cse.unsw.edu.au, slash, and then the um, path to the file, which, um, as far as web server is concerned, is tilde CS2911. That plonks me in my HTML, public HTML directory on that server. And then um, oh, the subdirectory was called what 10s1, and the file was called demo.html. Let's hit the button and see what happens, and then we're going to try and replicate this ourselves. So I'll just hit the button, let's go. Ah, I found the page, I displayed it. You see, it's got the heading, it's got um, the exciting text, and we've made uh, a link to a, a file on another computer and displayed it on this local computer here. Woohoo! Now. Um, one neat thing that you'll probably do over and over again when you're fooling around with this is you want to check to see what text your browser actually received, what was the message. When I hit the enter, when I said go and I hit enter, yeah, here now, a message goes from my local machine up to the web server at this address. The web server looks at the message, which is called a request, and decides, okay, I'm going to send back the web page and blah, sends back the web page and that's called the response and that's the HTTP protocol um, basically a request goes up and a response comes back at the end now if we wanted to see what the web server sent us we could go view page source and that'll show us the HTML source that was sent up and you probably recognize it that's the source that was on that file and it did get sent to us and then the browser rendered it in an attractive way so that's what the HTML text sent was, but was that the whole communication? No, no, no. Um, what happens when you use the HTTP protocol is a request goes from your browser to the web server. And that request consists of um, uh, an initial line, which tells it what we're after, called the initial request line. And I'll show you the format of that line in a sec. Then perhaps it sends some other information, some header information, which consisted of a series of lines um, with a, a name uh, and then a colon and then the value that's attributed to that name. So it might say host colon and the name of the host and things like that. And that's just a whole lot of sort of admin stuff that we're telling the server. Then a blank line and that's what indicates to the server that okay all the HTTP sort of data, metadata has been finished. What follows now is the actual data in the request. And we didn't request anything. We just said give us the file. All the data is just in the file. We didn't send it credit card numbers or anything like that. So that would have been a blank request. So our request to the server just would have been, get me this file, some header information, boom. And then the server responds with an HTTP packet. And that would have been, um, first of all, the response line that tells us um, from the server uh, that it was successful, and so on and so on, or perhaps that it wasn't successful. Then some more header information from the server to us, and then a blank line, and then the HTML page. So the browser, when we do a get source, just shows us everything after that blank line. But if we wanted to see the whole communication between um, the browser and the server, well, there are plugins you can put into your browser which do show you the whole thing, but let's have a look at it in Java instead. So what am I going to do? Well, I've written, um, as you know, I showed you in lectures, uh, a mindless client and a mindless server. The mindless client pretends to be uh, a web client, a, a, um, like an H a browser, like Firefox, 
and the mindless server pretends to be a web server. So that's pretending perhaps to be w, the same as the machine we've got running on the server we have running on www.csc.edu.au, um, which is an Apache server. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat that communication we just did then between my Firefox and the web server, but we'll replace either the Firefox end or the web server end with a false program now, a program written in Java, and that will um, let us inspect what's going on. So first of all, both the programs, the mindless client and the minus server, the ones we'll use to pretend to be each end, all refer to this class, which I just knocked together very, very quickly. It's a mindless class, not even brilliantly written, I'm afraid. Just knocked together in like three seconds to, to um, encapsulate the data in a connection. So the member talking over HTTP relies on having a TCP connection, a, level, a connection at that level of networking, and that's given to us in Java through something called sockets. So we're going to have um, set up a socket between the client and the server, and then we'll talk over that socket, sending messages up and down the socket. Um, so this one, the, this client connection, all it does is, if you want to make a client connection, you say the name of the machine you want to talk to and the port you want to talk to, and this creates a socket to that port. Then it attaches a reader and a writer to that socket, and we're going to use that reader and writer to send and receive messages. And then it generates, um, it provides two methods, a send and a receive method, that use that reader and that writer. The writer we called out, and the reader we called in. I think. Yeah. It's got some other methods too. Oh, something to close everything up neatly at the end, and something to tell us when we've finished receiving, when the um, person talking to us has essentially hung up. It's essentially giving us a beep, beep, beep. Is that um, on, on a phone you get that message? Well, here we don't get that message. We get uh, a true return from this function instead to tell us when the connection's over. Okay, so that's our basic thing. That we, That's just the thing that lives under the hood. It's going to be giving us our connection, um, and that Java um, code is up on the um, server, uh, up on our, our course web page already, so you can see that. Now let's look at the mindless client. Um, why am I speaking so quickly? Um, I don't know, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> let's play some music and relax me and slow me down.
Okay, here's the mindless uh, client. It's fairly straightforward. I've just made the uh, constants, the address name of the machine we're talking to and the port number we're using to talk to that machine. Uh, and all the client does is sets up a client connection here, which gives us a socket and the reader and the writer that we need. And that's the code you saw a second ago. And we also set up a reader to read from standard input because um, what this program is going to do is uh, it's going to ask me to type in what I want sent up to the server. Rather than Firefox sending it up for me, I'm going to manually type in what I want sent up. And here's how it goes. I simply type stuff in. And until I hit a null, so until I type into file, um, every line I type in will be sent, will be printed out first of all, sending, printing out what I'm it's about to be sent it up, and then using the client connection, we'll send that to the other end. And then we'll pay. When I finish typing that in, we'll then um, in the string response line, we'll load in, uh, we'll load in from the uh, socket the data we receive back from the client, a line at a time until it's all over. And then we'll close everything out and print it done. Okay, let's run it. All right, waiting for me to type something in. Now, what was the address? Again, it was uh, www.cse. Oh, yes, 10s1 demo. All right, here's how we go. First of all, the HTTP protocol requires me to, the first line that I'm going to send to the server is going to say, I want to get some data. The protocol has a couple of different methods it uses. The most common one for web pages is get. Um, then I need to say the path to the file that I want it to give me, and I want it to give me the file, well, it's tilde cs2991 slash 10, HTML. And then I need to tell it the protocol I want to use, which is the version of the protocol, which is HTTP, SSU 10.0, and boom, it sent that line up to the server. Now, remember, I have to send a blank line that means I've finished sending all the header stuff and then I'm not going to send it anybody. There's no information to send up, so I'll just go Control D. That's the end of my request. And bam, straight away we get a response from the server. Let's see what we've got. Oh, file not found. No, oh, what do we get? Oh, well, look, I've typed in the wrong address. So the server sent back a web page saying it couldn't find the file. Let's watch the server actually do that on a web client. And from Firefox again. Oh, I did here. I said one s one instead of ten. Let's request one s one. Notice I'm asking the file that doesn't exist. And it says, oh, no, you've made a mistake. File not found. Blah, it sends me this big complicated page. What's the source for that page? Blah, 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 blah. That's the HTML that generates this attractive page telling me that I've made a, uh, a mistake in my URL. And lo and behold, you can see, here's the same source. That's what got sent down. All right, so we can see the HTML part of it by looking at view source. But what we can't see is the start of the response, the HTTP sort of header information. Let's have a look here, down to here. Everything after here is available inside the web browser, but this stuff here, hmm. All right, so what did it do? The response contains an initial line saying, uh, well, this is the protocol I'm using, and a code saying, file not found, you must know 404s, you must send them a fair bit. And then it's got, got some header information. Remember I said the header information is a name, then a colon, then the attributes of it, so the date is that, and the server is this, and the connection is closed, that just means close the connection after this is done, which is what happens mm -hmm. anyway. Content type, this is pretty important, it means the body that's about to follow is um, a text file, and it's using HTML formatting, and this is a particular character set it's using. So it's saying what's following is going to be some HTML, and lo and behold, blank line that finishes that. Lo and behold, what follows is the HTML. Okay, but that wasn't quite what I wanted. I actually wanted to get the real page, so let's try that again. Get. Uh, this will work for you, of course, if you type it at home as well. If you can connect to that page over the web, you can con your client, your fake client, your mindless client, can connect to it. Too. Uh, of ten is this time. Using HTTP slash zero. So send the blank line, terminate, boom, here we go. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Here's the page, again, you saw it. Simple web page, there's the HTML text. And here's the HTTP header information. You can see the initial line saying, yep, okay, found it. Not a 404 this time, but a 200. 200 is good. Um, found the file, here's the date and time it found the file. The server, oh, it's telling us all about itself. The date the file was last modified. An e tag that's useful if you're crossing the hover bridge. Except ranges, 
who knows what that means, content length, how many bytes are in the message. That's really important actually. If your um, if the content is see the content here is text HTML, it's sending me an HTML file. So I know when that finishes, it's when the text file finishes, when there's an end of file character. Or um, I guess I only even need to read as far as the close HTML tag and that'll tell me it's reached the end of the file. But if it's sending a binary file, like if it's sending a, an image or a video or something like that, so the content type would be not it would be binary slash something. I can't actually remember the mime type name for binary files, you'd have to look that up. Google MIME types, M-I-M-E types, and that'll tell you the um, different types that can go here, where I file it at the moment. Um, but if it was a, um, uh, some sort of image or something, then uh, this would tell us the length of the image in, in, uh, in bytes. Okay, cool. All right, so you've seen um, a fake communication going one way. Now let's see a fake communication going the other way. Um, we've seen what the server sends back, but let's look at what the client sends up. Uh, now, we know what our client set up, because it printed it out as it did it, but what does Firefox send up um, when it talks to the server? Well, let's find out by getting by being a, turning ourselves into a mindless server and getting Firefox to request a page from us, and we can see what it puts in the request. So here's the mindless server here. Everything's more or less the same as before, except now we need something called a server connection, rather than, I think I just called it a connection before, so what do I call it, a client connection. Um, a server connection is just like the normal the connections we had before, except um, the socket it sets up is called a server socket rather than a normal socket. And the server socket has this neat feature that it just sits there listening, waiting for someone to make a request to it. And when someone does, it um, gives you a normal socket and you can have a dialogue with whoever's talking to you over the normal socket. And the server socket stays there. So does that make sense? The, it gives you a client socket that's the new um, connection to the person you're talking, but the server socket remains, which you can probably guess why it does that. It means it's available for someone else to make a request or another request. And every time a request comes, it just gives you a, a socket for that request. So you'd leave the server socket there constantly and you generate new sockets every time someone connects to it. Now, for a normal web page, that's pretty important um, because a web page itself might contain um, uh, a, an HTML the HTML file, so it'll request that first of all, and that might request a CSS file inside it, so the same server would, typically the same server, then would get a request for the CSS file, and it might request, might have embedded in a whole lot of images that are stored on the local um, web server, so to serve up one page, it might there might be um, 10, 20 HTTP requests going backwards and forwards between the browser and the server to fetch all the objects that it needs to assemble to display that page to you. So if you didn't set up a ser uh, the server connection properly and only made one, only allowed to have one connection to happen, you'd only get the first part of that. You wouldn't be able to then serve up the other pages. Um, so my mindless server, sadly, is so mindless that it only does one connection. Um, so if you were going to modify this, you'd have to have it. it a sensible way of doing it would be to, after you've um, received one connection, then listen for another and, and another and another. Do it inside a while loop. Don't, don't just terminate. I print done when the connection's over, but you won't do that. Right, here's what my thing does. It's very, very simple. It says, uh, uh, it sets up a server connection. Uh, it sets up an array list, which is just a list of uh, requests. These are empty at the moment, just empty strings. Uh, well, it's an empty array list which can hold strings. And as the requests come in, we're going to stick it in the array list and remember them. Why don't we just print them out? Why are we going to remember them? Ooh, you'll see in a sec. So here's how it goes. Um, yeah. Got a, um, we just have a temporary um, string called request line and we're going to store the request in it line by line as it comes in. And here's what we do. While the connection isn't finished receiving data from the client, just uh, loop over this, receiving a new line, um, adding it into our list of lines, so remember it, and then print it out. So we're not actually responding to the request at all. All we're doing is logging what the request was because that's what we're interested in. Um, and then because the web client, because the web page, Firefox, will be bored, it'll be saying, send me this page, and we're just, we're just interested in what it said, so we've recorded what it said, but so as not to let it down in disappointment. Let's give it a page as well. So um, here's a page that I, I just copied back, uh, a page that I got a few days ago, and I'll send it that page back. So here's the header saying, okay, and then all the, um, okay, your request worked, and then all the tags here, which is going to tell it, the uh, most important thing is that it's getting a text HTML, it's getting an HTML page back, um, then a blank line, and then here's the page we're sending it. 
It's a pretty boring page, HTML, just a head with no title, a body with no title, a body with no con uh, title in it, but a pre-tag, which means pre-formatted text, and it just prints, sorry, please try again later, and then close the body and close the HTML. So, we're done. so it'll just get a, a dud page saying, sorry, please try again later. Let's set that running. Oh, and we, this tells it the port we're listening on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you set up a server connection, you have to say what port it's listening on. And we're going to listen on port 2911. You can't listen on ports below about 1024 because the operating system reserves those and it'll grumble if you try and listen on those. You'll think you're trying to do bad things. But um, numbers above that should be free. Uh, or if they're not, try another number. That's the science of networking. Now, um, I was going to say something then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about what's happening here in terms of the flow of command uh, of time? Uh, right here, we set up our connection, and then I seem to be assuming that straight away we've got some data. But what if we don't have data? This is a server; it sits there listening. It might listen for a week before anyone tries to connect to it. If it's a really unpopular website, um, so it can't do this straight away, can it? It'll just, it doesn't have anything to print out. Well, what happens is, as you know. Java just mindlessly executes line at a time calling functions and when each function returns it drops to the next line and the next line and the next line and that's what it's going to have to do now because that's what Java does so let's see what happens it sets up the connection sure it sets up it does an allocation getting ready um, setting up to store the a list of um, requests as they come in it um, initializes um, a, a reference to a string object um, it sets this counter to zero while the connection is not finished receiving uh, it won't be finished receiving, so it'll be happy. And then it'll drop to this line here, request line equals connection receive. Receive something from the thing. Now, if there's nothing there, we're not going to get an error or anything like that. But obviously it can't return anything. And in fact, that's exactly what it does. It doesn't do anything. It just waits. So you say, hey, connection, I'm running the receive function. Give me an answer. I'm going to store it in this variable. The connection doesn't say anything. So you just stand there waiting because the computer's mindless, isn't it? It just waits and waits and waits. And everything's free, frozen now until connection responds. And connection doesn't bother responding until it gets a line. And this is called blocking behavior. So the system's now blocked uh, on this I.O. It's waiting for this I.O., this input output to happen. When the data is received, it'll pass it on to here. The system will unfreeze and move on. And it won't even notice it waited a ridiculous amount of time. Because, in fact, that's what happens on every function call. Everyone freezes and waits for the function to return. And the notion of what's a ridiculous amount of time, well, that's in the eye of the beholder. So does that make sense? It's going to sit here reading lines until the request is over and then it's going to print out the response and then it's going to terminate. And as I said before, don't forget, a real program wouldn't do that. A real program would have a loop around this whole thing here. A real server program would have a loop around this. Wah! Would have a loop around this and uh, would just keep serving new requests. So after serving one, then it would just go back into blocking waiting for the next one. Let's run it. There we go. Server starting, it's listening on port 2911. Now let's tell my, um, uh, my uh, thing here to talk to it. Now, it's on this, it's actually running on my laptop, isn't it? I'm running the server, so I need to ask my laptop to talk to my laptop. Uh, I don't know the, UI, the uh, IP address of my laptop. Now I could find out, couldn't I? There's lots of ways of finding out the IP address of your machine. Um, but also, locally, your machine knows its IP address is 127.0.0.1. Or even easier, it knows your machine under the name localhost. So I'm just saying, oh, connect to localhost. Let's connect to me. Uh, I'm not going to use a default port of 80, so I better specify the port explicitly. And that's uh, 2911, wasn't it? So that's saying, connect to localhost on 2911. I promise there's a server there waiting to talk to you. And let's request this same ridiculous page. Let's see what we get. What's the server going to tell us? I'll move this a bit to the side, so hopefully you'll see some action happening on the server. Oh, there we are. Fetch that page. Sorry, please try again, Stephen Conroy. That's the page that was served to us. And meanwhile, underneath here, we can see all the things that actually happened. There's a server. It's listening on the port. Here's what Firefox sent to the server. Get, get me that line, please. The host. Uh, the message is coming from. Uh, and then who it was that's sending it, and all sorts of stuff about what sorts of files this client can accept and what, what Firefox will understand and some wistful thinking down here and then an empty line. Oh, and notice it is saying it can understand text HTML, which is pretty damn good because that's what's going to be responded to it. Ta -da! So that shows you the communication going both ways. Now the other nice little neat trick I made to the mindless server is this. 
So instead of sending an insulting message from Conroy, why don't we actually send the um, client, what's that server before? Why don't we send Firefox? Why don't we just echo back to it what it just said? I know that's annoying when my brother does it to me, so let's annoy Firefox by telling it literally what it said. Let's send back exactly the entire request that got sent up. So for every line in the line of requests, send it back to them. Now I'm doing it inside a pre-tag, so it's going to set up a web page, um, not give it any title or anything, have a body. It's going to say, sorry, please try again. And now let's change it. Did you say... Hmm. Really, I want the question marks at the end, don't I? Oh, I'll put them at the beginning. Yeah. Did you say? And let's print them all out. It's all inside a pre-tag, so it'll just get printed out nicely each line on a line. You should close that pre-tag. Like you're sending that message or something, closing pre-tag. And let's go. Oh, that's not happening. What have I done? Unresolved compilation problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I bet you saw that. You're calling out and I couldn't hear you because it's a recording. Okay, server starting, listening on 2911. So it's listening. And now let's go to my client. Let's access that page again. Boom. Hey, did you say? And now it's going to print out all the stuff that got sent up. Woohoo. So let's try typing in a different address. Because notice we send the same message no matter what address I type in. What if I request this file? wasn't able to connect to me. Was that because I typed in the wrong name for a file? No. That's because my client, if you remember, is very mindless. It connects, accepts one message and then shuts down. That was what that done at the bottom meant. It stopped. So I'll have to start it again. Let's start it running. Let's try again. But first you don't succeed. Ba bum Eh? Did you say? And here's the request line. Bit of a gibberish line. You got it. Last thing to show you now, something called proxying. How proxying works is when, um, and see, I said in my score here uses proxies, so I'm behind a proxy at the moment, and so will you be in the lab. Whenever we send a request, like if we're trying to Google someone or Bing someone, um, we will need to connect to the Google or Bing website. I think actually they're both connected to the Google website, don't they? Things just to wrap around it. Um, so my client, Netscape, oh sorry, Firefox, doesn't actually connect directly to Google. What it does is it sends the message behind the scenes secretly, without me even knowing it, to a machine locally at CSE, which then forwards it off to um, Google. And then when the response from Google comes back to that secret machine hidden at CSE, it forwards it back to me. So it sort of sits in the middle. It's a man in the middle. We talked about proxying a bit in the lecture, if you remember. Well, let's look at the mechanics of how that works. <clears throat> On my browser, let's open it up. Well, it was open. Let's go to Preferences. This is how it looks in Firefox. Advanced, Network, Settings. <clears throat> You'll see it's set up here to have a proxy. If I didn't want to have a proxy, I'd turn it off, and now I'd talk directly to Google. Oh, let's see what happens if I try and do that. I'd say, I'd like to talk directly to Google, please. Can I Google, oh, Google that, Google test. Ah, uh, you can't do it. We've got an error message from CSE saying, sorry, you're not using the proxy. We're not letting the message out. You're only allowed to let messages out if they pass through the proxy cursors. All right, so let's change our machine back so it uses the proxy. Proxy is called www-proxy.csc.usw.hu.au. The port's 3128. And localhost isn't proxy. That's why the message to me before was getting through unchanged. That means any addresses to anywhere pass through the proxy. Well, let's change the proxy. Change the proxy to be localhost. And let's put it on the other corner. Okay. Now, what that means is when my browser requests any page now, it's going to forward it onto localhost, expecting localhost to forward it onto the network. But you know, what's sitting at localhost at that address is a mindless server, it's not going to do anything, so we're going to sorely disappoint the client. So, 
it's, uh, it's coming up now. Can I connect to Google? Test. Proxy server is refusing connection. I tried to talk to localhost and localhost wouldn't talk to it. Why not? Because my server is a mindless server and only, it's already accepted its one connection. It's used its three wishes. Let's start it up again. Okay, ready for one connection. Try again. Ba bam. Eh, did you say? So here's the request that got sent to the mindless server. This is what Firefox does, in other words, when it's trying to get a message to Google through a proxy stored on localhost. It sends to localhost something that looks exactly like a normal request. The only difference being this part here in the get. Ooh, it's ridiculously long. Normally that would be just this. That would normally be the um, get request. But when it's proxied, the name of the machine and HTTP colon is stuck on the beginning. So if my machine was really going to forward that request on, I'd strip that off, forward it onto Google, uh, Google would respond and I'd forward it back. Does that make sense? I hope so. See ya. Oh no. I can see you. Go on, yeah. uh, Actually, I'd strip that off and forward it on if I was the only proxy, but because I'm inside CSE, I can't talk directly to Google, can I? So what I'd do to get this message out of CSE would be not strip that out at all and forward this on to the CSE proxy. And then it'll strip it out and forward it on to Google because my proxy isn't allowed to talk to Google directly because I'm inside CSE and no messages can get out of CSE unless they pass through our proxy. So just send it to our proxy and you can do all the work. Okay, I hope that all makes sense and I hope you found it exciting. And I hope you fool around and have lots and lots of fun with our assignment this week, which is to make an internet censoring machine that grabs um, any internet requests um, that are proxied through it and uh, fiddles and diddles with the responses sent back to um, allow you to surf the internet, but surreptitiously changing the pages you're looking at as you view. Um, okay, I hope you have heaps of fun with that, as Stephen Conroy is going to have heaps of fun when he does that to every Australian. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, see you. Bye.